Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 621. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today, September 29th, 2020. No, that is not green screen behind me. That's the camper. That's the RV. Some people call it the rig. I call it a monstrosity. So we're out here somewhere in North Carolina, just outside a town called Kingston. Uh, K-I-N-S-T-O-N, North Carolina. We're not on the shore anymore. We're uh, spending a couple days uh, repositioning the camper as we go south. We're going to be in Myrtle Beach next week and I think Savannah the week after that. Um, But I'm in a town that has renamed itself after the Revolutionary War, George. Uh, This town used to be called Kingston, with the G, Mm -hmm. King. Um, And after the Revolutionary War, everybody here was pissed at King George. And uh, they changed the name to Kingston. And uh, I guess for a couple years they actually changed it to one of the founders. (laughs) But changed it back again after he fell in disrepute. But uh, so that's where I am here in North Carolina. How are you doing? Pretty good. Uh, Florida, the governor has lifted the COVID restrictions. So that means restaurants and are back at 100%. Movie theaters can reopen. There are only county restrictions, but even the county restrictions are limited uh, to only a certain... In other words, you can't uh, say less... You, know, you can't make restaurants uh, have uh, less than 50% capacity. And in our own county, we've passed the threshold of new infection rate has fallen below 5%. So we're in the process of reopening our church for in public worship. So in Florida, at any rate, uh, we are doing uh, pretty well. We're coming out of COVID, uh, where other parts of the world are not doing too good at all. Yeah, I think Europe is going back to at least the threatening shutdown again. Uh, certainly here in the United States, we have. Uh, Parts. Uh, there's not been a lot of reporting here in America about this because we only report Trump news in the news in our national media. But uh, South America has been devastated by this. Uh, India is uh, going through its third wave. Uh, it's, it's troublesome to watch this pandemic continue its way through uh, this this horrible year in human history. Uh, before we get, you know what we forgot? I mean, I, Don't like is, the show. Yes, please. <laughs> For, you know, I've traveled a long way, so you could like the show. No, uh, please, if you get a chance, you're on Facebook, you're on YouTube, click the thumbs up to like the show, share the show. Um, we, I thought we would take a big hit last week talking politics, George, presidential politics in the comment section. No. They, you know, a couple of people, well, I came here for, I didn't come here for this. But in general, people, you know, they they went very easy on us in comments, even though we didn't know what we're talking about on politics. So we appreciate well, some that. of these people who complain come back each week to complain. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, oh, I don't know what to think you're being of that. you're being too unscripted. Oh, okay, all right, I got it, I, I get it, I get it. So, and if you have not subscribed yet, click that little red rectangle. It will subscribe you to the program, and then a bell will pop up. It's very important to uh, click the bell uh, because that will give you instant notifications when there's a new unscripted posted online. George, there's lots of little stories going on uh, in, in our, on Anglican Link we put there. And we have a well, story... we can start bre- with the, co- the COVID stuff. That, yeah, we'll start uh, with the COVID mentioned. stuff. And we have a story brewing that we'll probably report next week out of Zanzibar. Um, but let's start with the small COVID stuff. Well, the English and the Irish archbishops uh, have released pastoral letters mm-hmm. because in, Eng- in Great Britain, uh, the government has put in these uh, new restrictions, a rule of six. Uh, we mentioned this last yeah. week, but it's now sort of been clarified a bit more uh, because they believe a second wave is coming. And some of the restrictions, they're allowing churches to gather, but it's interesting. You can have no more than 15 people at a wedding no more than six at a funeral or a baptism. And if you are caught not wearing a face mask outside, it's a, could be a, it's a first offense is a 200 pound fine. That's and if you stiff. are, and if you're not, uh, if you're refusing to socially isolate, let's say you decide to go on vacation and uh, walk around town, 
you could have a fine up to ten thousand pounds. Wow! And one of the thing one of our readers pointed out to me, one of our viewers pointed out to me that in reading the Archbishop's statement, once again the archbishops of the Church of England have taken it further in their uh, policies than the government recommendations. They're being more cautious, more restrictive. Um, so it's it's a difficult time. Uh, it's always been a difficult time for the Church of England, but the leadership once again is not uh, showing itself in its best colors, I believe. I think we're just a cut. Maybe, maybe, and if we're still doing this in a decade, we'll be referring to it as the former Church of England. Um, I think if you hear little raindrops, that's just the, the dew from the tree. And if by chance you see me kill one of God's creatures, these little skeeters, that's, that's just life out here. Um, I think we'll be calling this the former Church of England within a, at least a decade because I think COVID is really showing the stripes of who the leadership in the Church of England are and what their priorities are. Their priorities are not protecting the people. The priorities seem to just be protecting themselves. Um, but even if you say that and I, I agree with you there, mm -hmm. but I don't think they've thought through the leaders of the Church of England these policies because uh, Justin Welby and Sarah Mullally, the Bishop of London, had an article published in I think it was the Telegraph where they complained. Uh, it was the Daily Mail, well, one of the national newspapers, where they complained about the government being overly centralized, trying to manage the entire country with one policy. They said that there should be local options and subsidiarity and all that good stuff. And now the Church of England then turns around and creates national policies in the same model that the government does. So that if you're uh, a church on a university campus with nobody over the age of 25, you have the same rules as a, as a, uh, as a chapel at a nursing home with everybody over 75. So that the centralization and the bureaucratization of the Church of England is on full display in this in this pandemic, and it's not serving the church well. You know, in the contrast, in the United States, I'll speak of my own situation. Here, we have uh, guidelines handed down by the bishop, uh, and in various parts of the diocese, people are completely open, people are completely shut. It depends upon the local circumstances, and the bishop trusts you to do the right job for your situation. He'll offer his general views, uh, but he will not say, this is what we must all do. And that's pretty common across some states. But then you have states like California, which follow the English model and say, everybody must shut down and nobody may worship. And you have all these lawsuits uh, percolating and a big government is I think maybe one of the casualties from from COVID. Well, we'll have to see. It's I just mean, shown to be so bad. You know, California being a, a wonderful example. California wouldn't let Tesla go back to work, and then Tesla said, "Okay, we're going to Texas," and I think that's still in the works. Although though it had slowed down, now that they're letting Tesla stay and work uh, without all the restrictions that they're offering the churches. Uh, you know, California has discovered that they can only push people so far. And we'll, see, you know. Well, some of the things that are really extraordinary, um, my daughter used to live in Los Angeles and moved up to uh, San Francisco area for her, for her work. Mm -hmm. And she's still, fr and she's friends with her old uh, housemate, roommate, who lived in, uh, in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the mayor of Los Angeles done, Eric Garcetti has done, is he has eliminated all nuisance prosecutions. So, so what does that mean? <laughs> Towing yeah. uh, or vagrancy. And yeah. so they lived in a little residential street with these sort of apartment court places. And now they have these people parked in cars and vans who are living in their cars and vans, defecating on the streets in front of them fighting, doing drugs, and they call the police, and the police, you know, may come in an hour or two and basically say, cut it out. Um, Laura was saying, like, there's what, you know, her roommate was saying, there's this one Volkswagen van that has this woman with a uh, Rottweiler right in front of her doorway, 
and the woman smokes uh, narcotics and goes to the bathroom on the grass and she called the police and the police came out and said, you know, we can tow you because your license plate, you haven't renewed it in five years. And the woman said, well, you know, the mayor says you can't do any towing. So what's happening in a city of like Los Angeles, which the rents are prohibitively expensive, is that the because the government malfeasance, the uh, life has fallen apart. It's not the police's fault because no, they've they just the lost $100 million from right. their budgets and... Right. They are not allowed to arrest these people or move them along. It, yeah, it's the thing that Rudy Giuliani and uh, I think it was Bill Bratton, the police commissioner in New York, turned the city around on the broken windows theory, that every time there's a broken window, the police will respond and tell the landlord to fix it. No more squeegee men, no more panhandlers. And when they did that, crime collapsed such that New York under Giuliani and Bloomberg was probably the safest major city in the United States. Yeah. Now it's with police pullback and the government and the mayor there being an absolute fool, it's fallen apart massively. I have a friend who lives in LA and he has had um, what's a Land Rover illegally parked outside his uh, um, house for about two and a half months now. And he's called sent letters to the mayor done the whole thing and every in he said please tow it they're breaking the windows they're stealing the little license plate and i was talking to him said you know i wouldn't have los angeles tow the car in about another two months it's just going to disappear in pieces anyway as people are just stealing parts off it and yeah he called yesterday the tires are gone now that ah, see <laughs> <laughs> just weigh it out the mayor. You, you're you going to win in the end anyway. So it's just well, what the, the, the scary <laughs> thing is, uh, Eric Garcetti is being touted as, the, as uh, Joe Biden's Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. So nationally, we're going to get L.A. policies if Garcetti gets elevated to the top spot. It's, it's frightening. It's frightening. Um, tonight is the debate between Trump and Biden. And... You know, in, in my opinion, both of these guys are operating with their their check engine light on. You know, they're just not completely aware of all things going on or whatever. You know, I know some of you love Biden, some of you love Trump. That's fine. I'm not taking sides here. I have a favorite. Uh, I won't tell you who that is until after he or she wins or loses. Um, but, you know, it's, it's going to be fun tonight. But I can't watch debates, George. I can't watch stupid. I I've raised three children. I've I've watched stupid arguments uh, uh, between children before, and I just can't do it anymore. I I would have to take on alcohol to watch a debate. Uh, what does your family do? You guys just sit around the TV, pop popcorn, and go, "Let's go! It's the ring! It's the start! It's it's twelve <laughs> rounds of Biden Trump." No, if it's Tuesday night, Susan usually watches his home improvement show. Uh, mm -hmm. Property Brothers, I think it is, or something. Sure. <laughs> so, um, to be perfectly frank, I would only watch the debates to see if Joe Biden has a mental breakdown. Uh, not really interested in the policies or comments, but uh, yeah. rather just to see is are all the things that are people saying about his health and competence true, or is he going to be so doped up on Adderall or speed that he's just going to shine? and then disappear for three weeks as he recovers for the next uh, debate. I think the last debate I watched was Trump Gore. And I, I, I think I had an anxiety attack after that. Trump Gore or Bush Gore? Bush Gore, sorry. Yeah, Bush 2, Gore 1. And uh, I watched that debate and I'm like, oh, this is horrible. And then the election, when it was uh, finally decided by the Supreme Court because you people in Florida had chads on your, your uh, voting slips... That was anxiety as well. I just, I can't. That was one. Broward County. You can't blame us normal Floridians. You got to blame. Every state's got their place where like, well, thank God we're not like those people. Sure. For us, it's Broward. Uh, <laughs> it's Broward. All right. Fort so Lauderdale, what, Hollywood, Hyatt, all those areas. What else is going on in the, uh, the Anglican world out there? Well, we've got... Uh, well, Ireland and England are shutting down. Mm -hmm. Uganda is reopening. Other parts of the world are reopening, various places. Um, we do have a neat little story out of Zanzibar. 
A few months ago, we were given a petition uh, filed by members of the diocese given to the primate of Tanzania that accused the bishop of all these nefarious acts. And I sort of sat on it because, you know, it's a one-sided thing you really don't know. Well, then this past month, a public lawsuit was held, and it's currently in litigation, where the bishop is being sued for, as a, what was the old-fashioned word, a correspondent in a divorce case. That's the word, He yeah. was having an affair with the man's wife, who the man is suing for divorce, naming the bishop, and is seeking monetary damages for wrecking the marriage. And then, uh, then on Monday, the 31st of August, I finally had the news hook, which was the bishop has been at war with his clergy, Michael Hafid, and he has removed a, a good number of them from their jobs, and he's ordained and licensed people to replace them. Well, at the cathedral, uh, Kevin, you and I were there. Yeah, uh, beautiful cathedral. At the cathedral in Zanzibar, the members of the congregation blocked the bishop from coming in, and there was a fight uh, in front of the cathedral uh, where the bishop's mitre got knocked off and it was eventually it was stolen but returned, and bishop was whacking people with his staff. The police were called. And so and I've written to the bishop asking for his side of things, and I'll, I'll get that response, but he, here's the lowdown, and it's currently being investigated. It's all in the papers in Tanzania all the accusations the bishop has denied everything but the bishop uh, in this divorce case uh, is accused of getting the woman pregnant paying for her to have a of an abortion and uh, ruining the marriage he's accused of having a number of children children out of marriage he's accused of stealing diverting funds from the cathedral he's accused of financial and personal misconduct and it's quite an exciting uh, story, uh, Kevin Donlin, who uh, tells me is the assistant bishop of Zanzibar, wrote back and said, oh, no, 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 this is not true. You really do need to get the bishop's uh, answer. And I said, well, I sent this email. And he said, oh, well, the diocesan email has been hacked and it's control of the other side. Here's, yeah, which here's is, his private that's possible. email. That's possible. Here's his private email. Hmm. Ask him these questions that are being raised. And so as soon as we get a response, we'll, we'll go about that. But, but where, I'm, where I'm going with this is that two things. One, over the years, we have reported about crooked bishops. And I have written stories about Zimbabwe, Tanzania, Uganda, Kenya. I mean, just keep Rwanda, going. Yeah. Sudan, Congo. Rwanda. You know, there, I, I remember one the of my Episcopal first stories. Church. The yeah, one of my <laughs> first stories was the Rwandan bishop who was accused of participating in the genocide, mm, or the right. Sudanese bishop who was a tool of the Muslim government in their in their war against the Christian South. He mm -hmm. was a government minister, so and so. There and perhaps it's falling away, but there's always there's been a tendency in the United States to look at African and foreign bishops as being paragons of virtue. They're not like Charles Benison. They're not like Jack Spong, uh, and they're good and prosperous and clean. And the thing is, these guys may hold good theological positions on the issues that divide us, but then they also happen to be crooks or not adulterers. All, not all. Some not all. Do, some do happen to uh, be living in the world and of the world. And yes. And like, for instance, the Church of North India. Uh, at one point, the majority of bishops were under active criminal investigation for fraud. Now, that number has declined a bit because some people have retired, therefore they're not active, but mm -hmm. the fraud investigations continue. Mm -hmm. But it's very, very... When you get solicitations for help, aid, from overseas bishops, check them out. We reported these stories about the former Archbishop of Tanzania, Bishop of Dar es Salaam, Valentina Mokiwa. Mm -hmm who was one of the founding primates of GAFCON, who sources told us from the very beginning he was dirty. He had children out of wedlock. He was funneling money into his own pockets. He was you know, doing all of these bad things. And it finally blew up, and he finally was removed from office. And we reported these things. And I had several American people write, say, oh, well, I know him. I've got a good relationship. We send him money. 
uh, for his orphanage. And I've been there and I've seen the orphanage. Well, I don't know your particular instance, but the man's basically been defrauding foreign donors for a decade. Hmm. And how many people are buying the same, paying for the same food for the same orphan? And he's keeping the majority of it. Hmm. So just be careful. There is just because, how should I put this? Jack Spong and Charles Benison and some of the crazy bishops may be theologically heretical, but no one has really ever accused them of being criminal. Gene Robinson may have all these whacked out views, but at least the American system is pretty good at weeding out the outright crooks. Whereas in Africa, even in the Church of Nigeria, we, which is supposedly of Paragon, we have bishops who basic who have been accused of pocketing their clergy salaries and running basically virtual fiefdoms and the national church doesn't get involved because everything's quiet but it, you know well didn't we post a couple stories about episcopal priests that were uh oh yeah uh, it, handled we had two stories this week <laughs> sure. we had a priest in uh Worcester, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. sentenced to six years for possession of child porn. And it came out in the trial that he was having sexual relations with a 16 year old boy. Uh, well, boy who was now 16, mm -hmm. but Massachusetts, the age of consent is 16. So he didn't go to jail for statutory rape on top of it. And then we had a story out of uh, California, Menlo Park, a priest uh, pocketed $200,000 from the church. And the diocese says you're fired uh pay it back and if you don't pay it back within four years uh Go to jail watch the hammer drop yeah, so, so so is it there's such evil and corruption in the world that it pays for you to keep your eyes wide open uh, the maybe i'm just cynical after being a reporter for 25 years cool. but the glamour and romance of the episcopacy of the clergy has pretty much worn off. Yo, I mean, based, I, I, based you, my experience. you and I were, were raised uh, in the age of Jim and Tammy Baker, uh, Jimmy yeah. Swaggart, uh, where every weekend on their little TV shows they would beg for money, even though they had plenty of money. And Jim Baker is very famous for saying, "Oh, we have the money; we just have it in a different account." And they See, were it, they were the great best. at raising money. Uh, they were not great at being the Anglican. Believers. The Anglican model works best mm -hmm. when you have an engaged and vigorous lady with an engaged and vigorous clergy. Too often we have lay people who just go along with whatever the bishop or the clergy say. Oh, because he's so wonderful and he's so charismatic, and we're never going to we're never going to question what Chuck Murphy's doing because he is God's instrument in this world and that situation blew up and then you have places where you have frankly little dictators little senior wardens who run a church and basically the priest is a hireling and if they don't like him they kick him out it, a good anglican situation is where there's balance and trust and you have good lay leaders and good clergy mm -hmm. if you just have one side of it it's not going to really be successful i believe no, you're right if, if they are not all salt and light uh, they all become dark, and it just doesn't work. We've seen time after time after time, a church is led by a single leader, and the second he steps down, the church collapses. We've seen that inside and outside of Anglicanism, where it's just led by a figurehead. Uh, we've seen wonderful churches uh, go the distance when the priest spends his entire time raising up a flock that can replace him, uh, that is there to be there when he is not there, that is encouraged to be the body of Christ. And those churches seem to, yeah. to, to go the distance. In your neck of the woods, Terry Fulham in, in mm -hmm. Derry in Connecticut in the sure. 70s and early mm -hmm. 80s had one of the most dynamic, powerful Episcopal churches there was. Under its last priest, I think they were down to about a 12 people and there was lawsuits where the, the vestry were trying to get rid of the priest because of... Was know, it priestly enough? Yeah. Doing yeah. His job. No. You know, you can go from absolute heights to a dozen people. Yeah. Boy, that's depressing, George. Anything good we can record on this week? 
<laughs> well, God is still in charge. Absolutely. That actually, Kevin, th yeah. no, but Kevin, this is good stuff to hear. Yes, it is. Because I'll tell you why I say that. It's because if this stuff is not brought to light and not exposed, the church will never be able to purge itself of evil. If we have this, my country right or wrong, my bishop right or wrong, my church right or wrong mindset, then we'll never be able to purge ourselves and seek to be more Christ-like. We did a show two weeks ago, three weeks ago, called Willowing the Church, where we talked about what God was doing to the church. We also need to hold our leaders and our laity accountable. There needs to be accountable on the way up and accountable on the way down uh, within a church. And where there's a lack of accountability, you see a lot of people suffer for generations. And we've seen this within the uh, the Anglican Church, certainly the Episcopal Church. Uh, every denomination has suffered from this when they refuse to, to say, no, we're not going to teach that. That's false doctrine. And you are not allowed to teach that as false doctrine. When we stop doing that, we watch the church suffer for generations. Well, we, uh, we see this in the United States with the Roman Catholic Church and the clergy abuse scandal. Mm -hmm. The, the, the worldview and the mindset of the 60s and early 70s have really damaged the Catholic Church financially mm. to tune of billions of dollars. Uh, but also for the young clergy who are now in their 40s and 50s who are not part of that generation, they are bearing the burden of the abuse culture in the past. The old world of father knows best, and yes, he may drink, yes, he may be a little too free with his hands, but he's ours and we're not going to say anything, has turned around so that for some Catholic clergy I've spoken to, it's a worldview of when did you stop beating your wife? You're guilty and must prove an innocent. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where I'm coming in that if a church doesn't act, if, a, if an organization, a church, a people don't act from the very beginning, to maintain standards and discipline. If you excuse father's drinking because, you know, he's lonely, he's sad, and he does a good sermon on Sunday, you're basically, you're basically, what's the word I'm trying to use? Uh, you're partnering with the destruction of the church by not standing up for what is right and true. Um, and that is what Jesus calls us to do. He doesn't call us to preserve the institution. He calls us to make disciples and build the kingdom. And if you're more interested in preserving the reputation of important people, I don't think you're building the kingdom. Yeah. Well, like the Church of England uh, just announced a 200 million pound fund to pay compensation to abuse victims. 200 million pounds is probably what the diocese, some dioceses like Buffalo in the United States and the Catholic Church have paid out. I don't think it's nearly enough. Now, they may not get huge jury awards in England, but the, the, it, the Church of England has, I don't want to say as numerous, but one of the things I've, 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 I've learned over the years is that the rate of offending in the Catholic Church is no greater than the rate of offending in Protestant churches or among school teachers or among scoutmasters. There's nothing about being a Catholic priest statistically that makes you more likely to be a, an offender. It's the same ratio. And perhaps the reason why uh, the Catholic Church has been so notable is because that's where the deep pockets are. So lawyers can gather them up. I'm not saying that the abuse didn't happen. No, I think the, 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 biggest front, but. the biggest problem the Roman Catholic Church had is they just passed them from one parish to the other parish. There was a lot of shell game between uh, the, the, with the pedophile priest. You know. Well, that's what we saw in the, uh, in the Episcopal Church, mm -hmm. uh, where... <clears throat> The Episcopal Church, there was that case we reported where a Massachusetts priest who was a chaplain at a boys' school took some boys from Rhode Island up to Massachusetts, and while he was in Massachusetts, he molested them. And the headmaster found out and basically said goodbye, and the guy went and got a job as a priest in North Carolina. The headmaster said, you know, get out of here, I don't want to know anymore. 
And this man went on to offend at his parish in the wet mountains of Western North Carolina for 10, 15 years until he was finally thrown into prison. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the, the, the closing your eyes and shuffling paper is the time honored thing that you see in these institutions that have lost a sense of what they're there for. And in it's, the end, I, again, I want to say it's as common in the school systems mm -hmm. as it is in the churches. And school administrators are just as likely to shuffle people around or put them, um, but actually they have more money so they can put them on indefinite leave uh, in That's New York City. What, yeah, I was going to say, in New York City, they have a conference room where all the um, offending bad teachers just hang out all day long because they can't be fired because this is such a good teacher's union. Um, they all got caught red-handed, but there's nothing you can do about it because it's not worth the millions of dollars to kick them out. And the problem is not the clergy. The problem is not in teachers. The problem is original sin and the broken, fallen nature and the prevalence of sin in all aspects of our life. And where the church has fallen down, I believe, is not naming sin early enough and doing something about it. Well, because they haven't done that, sin has been redefined. We've redefined everything. We've redefined what godly means. We've redefined what a Christian means. You know, you used to say, I'm a Christian. It used to mean something. I tell people I'm a Christian now, and what are they envisioning? Who do they, who do they think of as a Christian? Are they thinking of it as a righteous, holy person as a Christian? Or are they thinking of the, the local guy who was arrested uh, for uh, molesting children? Uh, the, it, all these things have been redefined over the last uh, two or three decades and it's because we have not been accountable within our church well I have to give credit uh, to some bishops and to the ACNA mm -hmm. now I don't know everything about the ACNA but I know of one case in the Gulf Atlantic Diocese where a young priest sure. uh, uh, went to his bishop saying this girl is uh, threatening me that unless I marry her he's going to tell you that we've been sleeping together and the bishop said fine uh, you're suspended because you're not supposed to be <laughs> sleeping with a young girl uh, who's not your wife now that's so countercultural as not to be believable in social conversations but it's what should be done because the standard is you are chased outside of marriage mm -hmm. So kudos for the bishop in the Gulf Atlantic Diocese, Neil Labar, for doing the right thing, even though it would be unpopular. Like, oh, poor guy. Oh, 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 it's just, everybody's doing it. Well, that's no reason to do it. Amen. So Neil Labar, I would, I would argue, is less likely 10 years down the road to have these problems multiplied 10 times because he acts earlier and you know seeks to set a standard you know you, you know i'm going with this Kevin? well no I the mean, standard uh, is we stop everything until we get this sorted out mm -hmm. that's that's a great standard to have uh, all all operations cease until i get the whole story and what a great standard uh before we close out the show and this is kind of gone kind of long here excuse me while i show my age and i have to look over my glasses to see that oh we've been doing 34 minutes george <gasps> i feel sorry for our audience you guys are the best audience to let you up now front i need you as the best audience to pray for one of our archbishops um it was uh announced this week that archbishop benjamin kwashi has cancer um and in that response we don't act in fear <gasps> He has cancer. No. We go to our knees and we pray for his healing. We pray that he is uh, restored whole. We pray that uh, this is an opportunity for God to, uh, to draw Ben closer to him and to draw us closer to him. This is the way the kingdom works. We pray, and that's what I ask of you. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 621. Anglican unscripted.